In this episode of Hot Hardware's Two and a Half Geeks, we'll have more Optane. That's M O A R, more. 32 core thread ripper is coming. Corsair's magnificent Mark II's Microsoft's Surface is a Goa. And we'll go from five megahertz to five gigahertz next. And yes, welcome back. Happy hump day, everybody. Dave Altavilla for hothardware.com. And the show we refer to as two and a half geeks. And I'm feeling full geek today. Um, I don't know if that's because of my technical knowledge or because I'm just feeling geek. Probably the latter. Hey, Marco, Chris, how are you guys doing? Are you feeling geek today? I'm, I'm feeling particularly plucky today. Plucky. Yes. <laughs> it's magnificent. I'm not quite sure what that is, but I, I think I like it. <laughs> hey, uh, Chris, are you plucky or are you uh, friggin' plucky from Maine? How do they say that? Plucky from here? There? Uh, well, see, I'm from away, so I'll never really quite get it right. But uh, something grouchy, yeah. Yeah. P grouchy. Grouchy. So we're just going to, I say for the rest of the podcast, we just piss and moan. Everybody will love that, probably. Oh, right? this will be the best podcast ever. That is my forte. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, yes. Well, we've we we took Fourth of July off, so sorry about that, folks. Um, but we're back now, and um, it was a good holiday respite. Uh, gentlemen, did you guys do anything exciting on your Fourth of July Yankee Doodle holiday? I just uh, got to see family, got to see the fireworks at a amusement park I used to work at when I was a teenager, Rye Playland. Um, it's mm. actually a national landmark, had a really cool fireworks display. The kids stayed up late enough to watch without complaining. Weather was fantastic, so uh, all in all, pretty good fourth for us. Sounds like you did live like a rock star. Wow, <laughs> impressive. Chris, how about you? Um, well, Brittany and I went down for a picnic on 4th of July at, at the, the coast Fort Point State Park here. Um, other than that, mostly took it easy. And hello to Roscoe in the chat. I see it's your uh, first time on the show. And welcome. Welcome, Roscoe Truman. Welcome, Roscoe Truman. That's a great name. I think we, yeah, I think we should I, I wanna, I want to show my age and, and make a, a Roscoe Picole train joke from Dukes of Hazzard, <laughs> but no one's going to get it. I love that. What, go ahead. Say it. It's a joke. <laughs> no, I just wanted to say Roscoe Picole train. Roscoe Picole train. <laughs> I can't even do that. I can't even do that. Man, I miss those days. That was good stuff. <laughs> Oh, uh, let's see. looks like my window froze here, so I'm just going to keep talking to the camera, and then I'm going to fire up uh, the first headline and, and let you dive in, Marco, and then I'm probably going to drop from this thing because uh, I have a gremlin, but are you guys hearing me all right? I think you are, you right? Are. Yeah, sound great. Yeah, okay. Yeah, well, my video froze, so I'll reboot this thing, but in the meantime, what doesn't freeze... We can see you. Yeah, <laughs> it's good. I'm just making pretend. Hey, so in the meantime, Intel's Optane memory doesn't freeze. Last I checked. And Marco, you played around with a refreshed update, larger capacity, new version of the technology. Tell us, tell us what it does. Yeah, so when we so let's not confuse the, the, anybody watching with what Optane memory is. So Intel has Optane memory products that are essentially M.2 SSDs. They also have Optane standalone drives. Now the Optane memory devices, although they can function as standalone solid state drives, they're lower capacity devices and they're really meant to be used with uh, Intel's uh, smart caching technology, which will essentially cache the most frequency used pieces of data on a slower drive, put it on the Optane device and accelerate the system. So when Optane memory first hit, there were two capacities. There was a really small 16 gig drive and a 32 gig drive. And the Optane memory technology only accelerated boot volumes. So it essentially cached um, lots of the, you know, lots of files associated with Windows, which gave the system an overall boost in performance. But over time, so yeah. the, the 3D crosspoint memory used on uh, on these devices, you know, Intel has uh, got larger capacity chips chips now. So oh, I forgot to take the uh, batteries out of the phone. So they have larger capacity devices now, 
And not only that, the software has been updated so that it can accelerate secondary volumes. It doesn't have to be your boot volume. So not only do we take a look at a 64 gig drive, but we also use it to accelerate a one terabyte hard drive that housed something like, like a Steam uh, direct, you know, a Steam installation for games. And yep. what you find is, you know, it's it, it, you find what you'd expect. For data that's infrequently accessed, it performs like the hard drive. But if there's a game that you're playing a lot, if there's data you're accessing a lot, it basically gets copied to the Optane memory and it performs like an SSD. So you, you can have a single, let's say you had an eight terabyte hard drive with four terabytes of games on there. That would mm -hmm. behave, it would behave like a single eight terabyte SSD with your most frequently used bits of data. So it's pretty cool tech. Wow, now, correct me if I'm wrong, this is uh, M2 gum stick form factor. Um, mm -hmm. Doesn't work on every system though, right? It has to be, um, what's the platform and newer that it right. is compatible so, with? Opt Optane memory, uh, so the dri as a standalone drive, it'll work anywhere, but to use Optane memory acceleration technology, you need either a seventh or eighth gen uh, based Intel Core seventh or eighth gen based system with uh, basically the upper end of the 200 series chipsets or the newer 300 series chipsets. That, that's that's what it'll work. So basically cool. any newer Intel platform. Cool. And and really, uh, uh, a one terabyte or maybe even multi terabyte hard drive performs like a solid state drive? Seems like a stretch. So, I mean, <laughs> yes Play and no. Is that right? Yes and no. Like if you're if you're doing huge sequential transfers, no, because it's it's new data. Um, it's not cached. It's going to perform like the hard drive. Right. But if you have a four terabyte Steam installation, right, and you have tons of games, if you're like most people, you're probably playing two or three games at a time, max, and all of that data will likely get cached, and those games will perform like it's on like it's on an SSD. So just to give you a quick example, right? Middle Earth Shadow of War. And now for our testing, I, I wasn't playing Shadow of War constantly for like a week. I loaded and I loaded the game, played, exited, loaded the game, played a little, I probably six, eight times just to, to make sure the caching technology, you know got to see yeah. some activity. And load time went from uh, just under 42 seconds on the hard drive alone to only 29 seconds cached. And that mm -hmm. includes some animations that sort of mask loading. So there's a huge difference, you know, in terms of responsiveness of a game. So, I mean, the answer is yes and no. All, all of these caching technologies, all of these tiered memory systems where you take a slower drive and, and cache data to speed it up, they always have a weakness with uncached data. It performs like the slowest link in the chain. But right. for frequently used data, it's fast and it's you know it's really handy. If you have someone, let's say you have you know, you know I, I don't know, you have a nephew who's just getting into PC gaming that doesn't really understand managing multiple volumes with you know C drive for Windows and a D drive with a hard drive for Steam, and they don't really know what they're installing where, and they fill up their SSD quick, and it's a pain in the butt. But if you want to just have a single volume that behaves like an SSD that's big, like a hard drive, you can do it with something like this. So it's it's handy technology, maybe not for you know super enthusiasts who are going to manage their system properly and want all solid state storage. But but there is a place for this kind of stuff. Nice, nice. Yeah, and I th I think what what you're referring to here is really what is essentially mainstream use case as it relates to system responsiveness. So. Loading applications, certainly game level loads, as you as you indicated. But you know, maybe you're firing up Photoshop, firing up Word, even a web browser, snapping open. Um, you know, these are these are going to be uh, trace uh, operations applications that are you know frequently utilized. Like if you looked at your you know task manager, um, you know current processes. You know, you, every day you probably have the same six or eight applications that are running off and on during the day. And, and Optane is going to remember all that, all, you know, all, all those access patterns, right? Exactly. That's exactly what it does. Very cool. Very cool. Chris, have you played with the Optanes yet? Uh, I have not really had my hands on the Optane yet. I did want to ask, what's the pricing looking like on these? Is it coming down yet relative to the... SSD solutions or 
it's it has come down since launch but uh, there is definitely a premium um at the time i published the piece the 64 gig the largest capacity Optane memory drive is 150 bucks that's that's really pricey you know you uh, in terms of yeah. you know 120 gig uh, nand based ssd you can get them for like 50 bucks now um the 16 gig the small drive is 57 dollars now <laughs> there's kind of a balance here if you have a smaller hard drive you can probably get away with the 16 gig or the 32 gig one to accelerate it but the bigger the the, the bigger the cache the better so you know the higher capacity the better nice nice hey whose doggy is that barking in the background oh it, it's mine it's my <laughs> my door's closed but when you have a a, a seven-year-old autistic girl messing with the pup you're gonna have some bark <laughs> 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 oh, that's awesome. I, you know, it, it sounded like, you know, maybe um, it, uh, she's her bark is uh, a little smaller. Like maybe it's because it's through your door. I almost thought it sounded like a little like, um, I don't know, like a terrier or something. But well, no, she's small. You know, yeah. she, she's she's big inside. You know, she's a lab uh, pit bull mix, but she's only 40, yeah. what, 42 pounds right now. So Matt, she, uh, she only 42 pounds. Yeah, she's bigger yeah. than my dogs. Nice. <laughs> nice. Very cool. Well, you need a little ambiance. So, you know, the family's all here, including the dog. So that's that's the way we roll. Here. That's okay. awesome. That's awesome. Um, a question on last before we move on from Optane. What what do you think this this technology looks like moving forward? Because we've got We've got Optane drives, you know, full up, you know, 480 gig, you know, and so on, you know, multi hundred gigabyte drives, as well as these 32, 64 gig caching sticks for as Optane memory. What does this thing look like moving forward? Because it's clearly, in many cases, superior technology to standard NAND flash. Yeah, I mean, long term, I think 3D Crosspoint is going to be revolutionary in terms of what it does for the PC. In terms of caching technology in particular, actually, I think I'm hearing Chris's dog now in the background. But in terms of caching <laughs> tech in my particular, neighbor's dog, <laughs> they will, um, I think it goes away as, you know, NAND or 3D Crosspoint type memory becomes ubiquitous in all systems. But yeah. There you go. Yeah, you know, maybe I wasn't so, being fooled, actually. That that could have been uh, that could have been Chris's next door neighbor Schnauzer barking. Okay. No. So we uh, have a we have a lab. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. We we had a question in the chat. It says does AMD have a competing product? The answer is yes. I think they're calling it Storage MI, or I might have the name wrong. But um, all right, yep. AMD acquired a, acquired a company that actually not only could you cache a hard drive to an SSD, but you can also use RAM. So it's like this multi-tiered solution. Um, and you can get some really killer performance. I, I've played with it enough to be familiar, but not enough to write a full review yet. And uh, yes, AMD does have similar tech, but it's not using 3D, um, the 3D cross point memory, like Optane memory. You would use a, a standard NAND based SSD or a portion of your RAM. Right, yeah. Um, Optane co-developed by Micron and Intel, or I should say, 3D crosspoint technology uh, memory um, co-developed right. by uh, Micron and Intel. There, cool, very yeah. good stuff. Very good stuff. Well, let's uh, let's move on and, and actually stay on the PC thing. And I'll I'll talk a little bit about what I looked at recently. Um, Corsair's K70 RGB Mark II and the Strafe RGB Mark II. These are mechanical. Gaming keyboards by Corsair, uh, as the name implies, they are very RGB, uh, red, green, blue backlit. Um, they actually have a number of different configurations you can set up in Corsair's software. Uh, impressive um, product for sure. Corsair builds, what I've found over the years is that Corsair builds really good stuff, like premium stuff. You usually don't find Corsair in the low end, um, you know, cheapo kind of inexpensive product. You tend to find them more in the high end. And I think the Strafe and the K70, which frankly, you know, these are probably third or fourth generations of, of both keyboards, um, are, are more of the same. These are, these are really high end decks. They come with multiple different flavors of uh, key switches to choose from, Cherry MX key switches. In the case of the K70, there's like half a dozen from Cherry MX reds to browns to, to blues, um, and clicky, non-clicky, tactile, non-tactile, you know, without a bump, um, all kinds of different configurations for the K70. The Strafe has, uh, it, can, it comes mainly equipped with silent switches 
and I'll give you a look at it right here. This is not plugged in and lit up, but this is the uh, this is the strafe with Cherry MX Silent Reds, um, and uh, they are non non tactile linear switches, and but full mechanical, and they are silent, so you can use them on podcasts and not annoy everybody. I'm right now using the K70 RGB Mark II with um, Cherry MX Blues, which are clicky and tactile. Um, anyways, great stuff. Um, if, if you're looking for a high-end mechanical keyboard, uh, certainly for gaming, where you can do things like customize key zones, W, A, S, and D, or maybe key zones for MOBA, um, these, these keyboards have that capability. Um, and again, just built with the kind of quality that Corsair is known for what they sort of pride themselves on nothing nothing cheap about them even the cables like if you look at these braided usb cables there's usb pass through so you get a pair of usb cables you can plug in and then there's a usb port on the back of the keyboard allows you to pass through usb so you have another usb port right up here on your desk and these cables are so thick and and, and long and, and braided that they're just they're just built to last and that's kind of the way these machines are they're they're like tanks uh, a couple other nice features. They have a new media key area. I don't know if I can get this in the frame. There you go. Focus, focus, focus. There you go. So yeah, these are media keys here. There's a nice volume roller, mute button, and was really impressed. Um, the strafe is a little bit lower end. There's some uh, machined aluminum trim on the top of the keyboard. The K70 is a little bit more premium affair. That's all machined aluminum. They, they weigh, you know, they're like serious girth to them, <laughs> you know. Um, so they, they just have a real, real quality feel, no flex at all. Detachable palm rests, which you can just, you know, snap right off in the bottom if you don't want to use a palm rest. Um, so I, I want to say the K70 RGB is like 169 and the Strafe 139 MSRP on Amazon. Really impressed. Good stuff. Um, you know, what I found in this review was that I am a Cherry MX, I hope I'm going to get this right, I think it's brown, that is uh, clicky or tactile, I should say, non-linear, tactile, but silent or quieter anyways, maybe not completely silent. The, the Strafe has a Cherry MX silent and that actually has dampening in it built into the key switch as well, but I'm thinking I'm a brown kind of guy because I, I like a little tactile response, but I, I don't want that racket. Marco, it, did I do this review justice? I know you're the keyboard aficionado, and I was all kinds of paranoid keyboard I wasn't going to do it right. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. definitely did it justice. Um, you know, I'm a little disappointed in you that you cannot get used to the blues because th there is a yeah. uh, poetry to a clicky key that is fantastic, mm -hmm. but they're not yes. for everybody. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm like you. I too do not. I do not like linear switches without the tactile oh. bump, and the, the dampened switches. So the the Cherry MX Silence basically, you know, even if you have a non clicky switch, most users tend to bottom out and cause a clack as the key bottoms out. The Cherry MX Silence have that dampener to quiet that bottoming out, um, and it, it doesn't. It adds a little bit of mush. That's not great. Not a lot. It's still a nice firm mechanical keyboard. Um, but mm. yeah, I, I I prefer personally if I was using a cherry keyboard, I'm still a cherry blue guy. If the clicky is getting to me, I'd also be cherry browns as well. Cherry browns, yeah. That well, that's yeah. it. I, I I'm trying to still trying to get used to the clicky, and I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and type over here and not try and not screw up the podcast. But can you guys hear that? Is that really loud? It's not loud to not me. Terribly. No. no, that's the good <laughs> microphone. It blocks <laughs> out true. the uh, background sound. That's true. It is. It is a side addressing microphone, and so if you're not addressing it from the side, it's it's better at rejecting ambient noise. So yeah, I guess that's a good idea. But um, keeps the focus on the talent. <laughs> Talent's relative too, I might add. Um, so yeah, it's a technical term in this case. So. <laughs> oh wow, I don't need to go that far. No, yeah, no, it's uh, <laughs> no, th that is, it's true. I'm I'm still getting used to the click. I, I don't really like the racket, but I, you know, I can't hop on the silent, the strafe, which came with uh, Cherry MX silent keys. I don't have enough tactility there. You know, they feel great. You know, they're nice shaped keycaps, sort of concave. 
Um, they are, they're also really great in terms of RGB, the, uh, the backlighting, the, the, the key switches themselves are clear. And that's not to be confused with cherry clear mechanical type key switches, but the housings are clear. And then, you know, obviously the letter and the keycap is also translucent and, and white. Um, but it really like they really illuminate well. So you can set them up with all kinds of different lighting options and it looks cool and you can coordinate, you know, with other peripherals. If you have like a, a Corsair mouse or something like that, you can coordinate there too. Um, but yeah, you know, I, uh, yeah, I've been typing on a deck um, and I'm trying to think I have, I think I have cherry clears on that one, Marco, right? They're silent, but tactile. Yeah, the, right. They're yeah. just heavier than the Browns. Right. Yeah. Um, and I was really sort of hooked on that, but man, I tried the, the K70 RGB Mark II. I'm like, yeah, okay. But it's got blues and I'm still getting used to the noise. Chris, what's your flavor of switch? Uh, well, I like blues. You're either go blue or you're wrong, but even <laughs> within a key switch, um, you know, depending on how the deck is built and everything else, you can get very different feels, even with, you know, one blue deck to another, you know, the, the back plane and other things are going to contribute to how it responds. So just because you don't like one keyboard with a particular switch, it doesn't mean you don't like that switch. Or maybe you think you like a switch because of a certain keyboard, like maybe you really do like blues on one, but then you try another one that has browns and it actually delivers a more similar feel than you might get with a blue switch on another keyboard. So the only real way to know is to get out and try a bunch of different keyboards and find what's comfortable for you. Yeah. 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 So I, I want to interject for one second. We, uh, bionic Bert in the chat, um, says he's, yeah. he's a member a membrane whore, um, because he hasn't found a mechanical <laughs> keyboard he likes. If you are, um, actually, if you prefer membrane boards and you have the budget, look at a Topre RealForce, T-O-P-R-E RealForce. It's a $300 keyboard. It's actually what I'm, I'm using right in front of me right now. And it's membrane? But, well, it's a, it's a capacitive switch. So mm -hmm. there's a rubber membrane, but there is a metal spring under each key and there's yeah. no physical switch mechanism. It's capacitive. So if you don't want the noise, you want something a little um, a little softer, but with the tactile click, the Topri Real Force is, is a kick-ass keyboard. It's just super expensive and hard to get in the States. I think only Elite Keyboards uh, sells the real one. There's a newer, cheaper one with RGB, not quite the same, um, but the Topri Real Force 103 is uh, is killer. It's, it's actually what I'm using right now. And I, I also want to say, um, Scott Wasson, formerly of Tech Report, now at AMD, has gone on like a mechanical key switch testing binge on Twitter lately. <laughs> like he's literally bought hundreds of switch yeah. testers and multiple yeah. keyboards. He's actually, I had a private conversation with him. He was trying to convince me that Cherry MX um, may not be the premier key switch anymore. And some of these Kale stabilized switches are unbelievable. I just haven't had a chance to try them yet. So there's so many different, you know, off-brand boards on mash drop and, you know, getting built on uh, Indiegogo and Kickstarter. It's tough to kind of experience them all, but I might have to go on a, on a key switch binge to, to test all these new switches out. Kale stabilized. What, what is, what is stabilized? What is so that? they have, they have the same, you know, um, the same stem as Cherry MX is right, so I think they'll work with. I think they'll work with mostly the same keycaps, but then around that there is another stabilizer that helps hold the keycap. So there's real minimal uh, wobble and there's minimal nice. movement. It's just the actuation. So you know, and there's tons of different actuation points and and uh, you know uh, force force curves and there's just so many options now. It's kind of dizzying. So yeah, those sound pretty cool. If you're a masher like me and you need stable switches, <laughs> God knows I mashed the keyboard. But yeah, stop by the site, check out Corsair's K70 RGB Mark II, the Strafe RGB Mark II. Um, we have a full review up on that, copious pictures as well as um, details on all the software and setup and uh, you know what uh, what might be for you. And of course, a YouTube on video, or excuse me, a video on YouTube. Easy for me to say in the review as well, because you, you got to see it to believe it and, you know, understand it. Uh, these things are uh, mechanical in, in nature. And so the, they do well if, to get the hands on, so to speak. Let's move on to uh, something we haven't got a hands on of yet, but um, Microsoft unveiled the Surface Go. Is it a goer? 
<laughs> what's that movie from? I forget. Does she go? 10 inch tablet starting at $399, fanless and light Windows 10 device. There it is, the, the Microsoft Surface Go. Chris, um, we have uh, slated you to discuss this product. It is interesting. Um, what what's 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 in it for us? I mean, obviously it's it's inexpensive, but you know, there's got to be something else. Than yeah. That. Well, and I think anyone <laughs> coming expensive. in and looking at this when they hear about you know a new budget Surface tablet, they're going to have flashbacks to the Surface RT, and Ooh, it yeah. like it looks like tentatively Microsoft may have learned um, with this because I'm not seeing any sign of it being pared down Windows. Um, pared down specs, yes, but it looks like it's still a fully capable tablet. Um, just, you know, it's not going up to a crazy i7 or anything else like you can get in in the the Surface 4 or, you know, upcoming Surface 5, whatever they want to call it. So mm -hmm. I think it is a very compelling looking little tablet. It's a 10 inch screen with a two by three ratio. So I think the uh, the Surface Pro has a resolution of 2736 by 1824, um, which is super high resolution on its, what is it, 12 inch screen there. Um, this 10 inch screen, it is a lower resolution. It's 1800 by 1200, but that's still right about full HD. And on a 10 inch screen, that's still gonna look fantastic. And for a uh, starting price of 399, I think this is gonna be a, uh, a pretty compelling uh, Windows tablet for more casual users. The creative types may are still going to want to go for the Surface Pro type options that have more horsepower. But for people who want a device to sit at home, kick back on the sofa, do some web browsing, some social media that doesn't necessarily want to deal with a mobile interface like you'd get on an iPad or an Android tablet, um, for 400 bucks, I think that's uh, a very nice start there. So, um, Inside, it's going to be using a KB Lake processor, the Pentium Gold 4415Y, um, which is a dual core processor with hyper threading. So it's kind of like a i5 of yesteryear, I guess, mm -hmm. if you want to say. Um, so its base clock is 1.6 1, 1. gigahertz, but it will boost up higher. Um, exactly how far, I'm not sure. It's a 6 watt CPU, which is super power friendly, so it should last a long time on a charge, which is one thing that mm -hmm. iPads do phenomenally well. You can set an iPad on a shelf, come back to it a couple months later, and it's still at like 95%. So mm -hmm. hopefully we can see you know some similar battery life out of this. You, um, you can get it with LTE connectivity if you want. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I'm kind of curious to see one in person because it's looking like a very compelling option. So four or eight gig of RAM, uh, 64 gig or 128 gig storage. Um, interesting. Uh, Windows 10S, I assume. So um, the, the Microsoft so, Store only. So with, yeah, it, it might be the Windows 10S, but um, I'm not sure if they're going to lock it to that or if they're gonna include the option to let you get the full Windows 10 if you want to. Um, right. I know 64 and 128 gig <clears throat> options sound kind of small, but there is a very nice trick if you do use OneDrive, which if you have an Office 365 subscription, it includes hmm. a terabyte of OneDrive. Um, they've added an option probably a couple months ago now where you can have your files like registered on the computer, but they're still stored in the cloud and they only download as you need them. So when you have a very tight drive, like a 64, 128 gig drive, you can still have all your files immediately accessible, but it only pulls them down when you need them. And then I think after 30 days or something, it just removes them back to the cloud. So yeah. a lot more potential with that. Cool stuff. You know, it, there's obvious comparisons right out of the gate with, um, you know, Apple, um, you know, iPads and, and iPad Pro. Um, I think I think what fo ne folks need to remember with Microsoft is you've got a full Windows OS here, um, and uh, whereas with Apple you've got iOS versus uh, Mac OS, and there's a difference there. The two ecosystems are separate for Apple. So you know, in this case, um, yeah, Windows uh, Windows on a tablet in um, Microsoft fashion, 10 inch. 
impressive um and it will be interesting to look at usb-c right so usb-c mm -hmm. connectivity as well as lte um so theoretically always connected um but nice to have that usb-c that is a first for a surface product i guess they were microsoft or excuse me usb only <clears throat> so usb-c anything else marco what do you think about this you're the microsofty of the group um i'm, I'm not too um I'm not too enamored with it. It seems, you know, so the type cover is not included. So the, the, mm. the lowest price for one of these guys is $399. And if you want the type cover, another 100 bucks. So you're yeah. at a $500 range for a, a really relatively low powered tablet. I don't know. I, I got to have to play with it. The form factor is nice. Microsoft builds beautiful devices. I'm sure it feels quality throughout. But um, it's a fairly low end device for five hundred bucks, in my opinion. I I would save up a couple hundred more bucks and go Surface Pro if you want that particular form factor, um, or just get some sort of convertible. You know, even if you went a, a generation or two back with a Core M machine, um, you could probably find something. You know, a full you know a two in one device for a similar price once you factor in the type cover and stuff. So, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I'm I'm I I love Microsoft's <laughs> products. This particular one, not totally sold on. So, in in terms of just you know straight up tablet competition, the the, the horsepower should be there. And if you're talking, especially with the eight gig of RAM setup, if you if you opted for that, is anybody buying sure. tablet? Like I don't really think anybody's yeah. buying tablets anymore. It's really pointless yeah, to buy a tablet, in my opinion. <laughs> when you when you have two and ones, <laughs> two and ones are really the same price point, and you can actually do things on them. You know, so yeah. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, th there's another there's another potential here um, in 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 the lower cost product category as it pertains to schools. What do you what do you think about? Oh, I think we just lost we Dave. Dave. I think we lost Dave. Are we still live? Let's see if we're still live, Chris. For it us. looks like oh, we are. I see him frozen oh. on the stream. He, oh, we're back, back now. <laughs> we're back. <laughs> okay, cool. We were. Did always you get here. that question? Oh, okay. I only froze. Sorry. Yeah, I did not get a question. I think you froze mid-question. Oh, okay. Oh, I'm freezing again. Dang it. Okay, let's try not to freeze. Don't freeze. I said, what do you think about the play for in, in schools and in, in education? What about that? Uh, a little bit lower cost price point there. I don't. I don't know. Um, so Chromebooks are just so wildly popular. Uh, in, in schools that I, I don't see Microsoft forcing their way in with this unless they somehow just blanket the schools with them for free. So I don't mm -hmm. know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know. If, I don't know if they're going to be. I don't know if they do that. But um, interesting stuff. We'll have to see how it uh, shakes out. And um, of course, we always like to to get them in before we pass judgment completely. That's for sure. So some hands on time will uh, tell the tale. Um, Chris, are you uh, are you at all thrilled with this thing, or, or what's your final thoughts before we move on? Well, I don't think it's going to be the device for me because I'm generally not going to be sitting there with a tablet. I I did used to carry around a Nexus Seven pretty regularly, but I think it's been several years since I did that. Phones are larger now; they're more comfortable for a lot of usage. Um, but if you're considering something for you know. <clears throat> Maybe your your parents or someone who just want a simple device that you're not going to have to babysit quite as much, um, but they do want more than, say, an iPad or, a, or an Android tablet, then it's certainly an option. Uh, there's certainly going to yeah. be a market for it. Yeah, yeah, we'll see. We shall see, Microsoft, the, the Surface Go. Let's move on to uh, the land of processors because uh, there's a lot going on there these days. Intel came out with a new processor to commemorate the 40th anniversary of the 8086. Uh, Intel's Core i7-8086K anniversary edition CPU. And uh, Marco, you took a uh, look at that and the review actually went up today. So this is fresh, hot off the press x86 hits five gigahertz what did you think you like that thing you like that six core beast so yeah in a bubble i think this is a really fun uh fun product so essentially the the so the full name uh, at least if you look on the box and if you're purchasing one is the uh, the intel core i7 806 uh 
8086 K limited edition. Um, I, I, as Dave mentioned, it's to commemorate the 40th anniversary of the original 8086 processor, um, which sort of laid the foundation for the x86 instruction set that we're all using across all of our yeah, everybody watching this has used a Windows device with uh, with an x86 processor. So um, it's the vast majority of the market. x86 dominates basically everywhere except for mobile where ARM is huge. But yeah, so this chip, um, it's fun in that it's the fastest mainstream desktop processor Intel's ever released. If you were to take a Core i7-8700K Coffee Lake-based 6-core 12-thread pro 12 processor and take the single-core boost and let it shoot up to five gigahertz, set the base clock to four gigahertz, and cherry pick those dies to get the most power efficient and overclockable ones available. That's the Core i7-8086K. Now, it's been a while since the 8700K, since Coffee Lake, I should say, since Coffee Lake came out. So Intel's also had some time to, you know, turn the dials and tweak the manufacturing process and get some maturity out of, out of, out of the chips. So what you mm. find is, the 8086K <clears throat> is the fastest single threaded, fastest processor for single threaded or lightly threaded workloads of any mainstream CPU because it's got Intel's latest core with the highest clocks ever, you know, five gigahertz boost clock on a single thread. But all of the multi core boost clocks are identical to the 8700K. So if you're whacking the chip with a full 100% load constantly, it's going to hit the same clocks as an 8700K and perform similarly. Now, the catch is there's a price premium for this chip. Mm. Uh, as of today on Amazon, when I went live, you could buy it for 419 bucks. A Core i7-8700K happened to be on sale for 340 something dollars. So about a $69 price premium to go from an 8700K to an 8086K. And really all you get is some better single thread performance. Um, and now I should say, because Intel's sort of cherry picking these dies and putting the best of the best of Coffee Lake on these chips, I found that under load and idle conditions, our particular chip actually used less power than an A700K, despite being faster overall. Also, um, with a basic, you're just a mainstream single, um, single, what is it, 120 millimeter Corsair H80 all-in-one liquid cooler, nothing exotic in terms of overclocking. I hit a, a stable 5.1. I could boot into Windows with all cores boosted to 5.2. I couldn't reliably complete Cinebench. I could get some numbers out of it, but I couldn't do it reliably consistently. So I didn't call it stable and I didn't report on 5.2. I just say I was able to hit 5.2. So a more exotic cooling, maybe some more voltage and some tweaking 5.2, maybe even faster as possible if you delid the chip. But um, more overclockable, more power friendly, highest single thread performance, but about a $70 price premium. So I know there's some people who be like, you're crazy to spend an extra 70 bucks on something like this when you can just get an 8700K. But I also know enthusiasts are pretty nuts. And if you want the best mainstream chip, 70 bucks isn't a lot of extra money to throw at a system. So um, yeah, interesting chip to discuss. I'd love to see if we get some comments in the chat about this thing. Yeah, you know, and the other thing that occurred to me too, though, for, for that extra price premium, you're getting a 300 megahertz or thereabouts base core boost correct so four gigahertz yeah. base clock versus 3.7 it's not a lot but, but it's something. I, no one I, I don't i don't think i've ever seen an intel processor run at base clock they're always in turbo like all cores I, I'm, I, I, it's basically yeah it's it, the 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 base clock is there i guess for moments <laughs> where it's at that frequency yeah. but most of the time they're turboing and it's the right. boost clock that's most important. Now, we have some comments. Another site um, couldn't even o overclock their 8086K to 8700 OC. You know, there, you're, it's the silicon lottery. Not everybody's going to get a, a more overclockable chip. That's a fact. Um, yeah. Generally speaking, the 8086K should be a little more overclockable mm -hmm. than, than an 8700K. It's not always going to be the case. That's just, you know, that's how silicon works. Um, so yeah, that's that. Chris, would you drop the extra seventy bucks or sixty, whatever it is? Um, I'm probably looking for more cores for what I do in the general uh, 
more mega tasking side of things. The that wasn't the question, Chris. I, I know. <laughs> I know it wasn't. Uh, I'm only kidding. I mean, I'm kidding. If, if these existed in a vacuum, yeah, I'd, I'd probably pay the extra seventy bucks for <clears throat> for the higher speeds and presumably cooler temperatures. <clears throat> uh, yeah, but I guess I mean, single single thread performance is going to be excellent with either one for gaming. So, I still want more cores. What what about well you know let's let's talk about the average gamer who doesn't care so much about more cores always the hardcore gamer now so when you talk about a six core chip that's enough mm -hmm. cores to drive any process any 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 game engine excuse me uh, from a processing requirement standpoint GPU uh, is is much more at play there but six cores is plenty and and actually clock speed in that case benefits you more so what about for the gamer. <clears throat> So it's benefiting you in use cases where you're probably getting frame rates exceeding what your monitor has anyways. So yep. again, with the CPU bound workloads versus GPU bound workloads with gaming, if you're, if you're gaming at a high refresh rate, or a, sorry, a high resolution like 4K, um, the strain is going to be more on your GPU. You could put a Pentium in there and you're probably not going to lose a whole lot of performance in some games. Some games are going to require more threads than a Pentium can put out, but clock speed wise, it's not going to matter so much. If you're doing 1080p high refresh rate, sucking so uh, like first person shooters where you're hitting 240 hertz or beyond, that's when you really want the CPU processing power just to get the frames ordered and out there. Um, yep. So, <clears throat> yeah, I, I could see in, in that case, yeah, you're going to want the higher clocks. Um, you'd have to benchmark them side by side to see if you're really in that danger zone or not uh, for the games you're particularly yeah. playing. But yeah, a lot's going to depend on the monitor you're you're playing with. Yeah, Marco actually did uh, do some side-by-side -side 1080p benchmarking in like Middle Earth and, and other, you know, medium quality sort of much higher frame rate. Now you're 150 plus frames per second if you're, for example, um, looking to, to be in a high refresh rate monitor and, and drive that thing. Uh, you're talking a couple of frames more a second <clears throat> versus the 8700K. So admittedly, um, you know, a marginal uh, benefit there. Marco, is, is, is that a fair assessment? Uh, that, that, that is a fair assessment. It's, it's not going to be massive. You know, um, we, we have some comments in the chat that said, a, uh, you know, Intel mm. should have soldered the integrated heat spreader on 886k um, i completely agree they also should have <laughs> boosted all of the they should have boosted all of the turbo levels even if it was just a little bit um, even if it was just slightly just so it could be faster across the board but you know it is what it is we're, we're what was the really high clock the, here what was the processor a few years back uh, skull canyon Sky, no, not Skull Canyon. I'm yeah, sorry. The, 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 for, the, 40, the Devil's Canyon, the 47 Devil's Canyon. Canyon. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, yeah. yeah. One of the canyons yeah. with skulls and devils. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah so, so that they actually did a little something with the Tim on that, right? I, you know, I don't remember. I think that one may have been soldered or it was just a higher quality Tim. I, I don't remember off the top of my head. Yeah. 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 It would have been interesting if they did something a little special there, a little special mojo uh in terms of the uh the interface to the uh to the the spreader anyways good stuff check it out the intel core i7 8086k 40th anniversary cpu um marco launched his review today and uh, by the way that article is doing quite well getting lots of eyeballs and you should come by and check it out too um, because it's at least worth pouring over to see what uh what intel can do at five gigahertz with six cores good stuff AMD, <clears throat> as we shift gears to uh, to a, a completely different realm of, of processor at the other end of the spectrum, is getting ready to launch their 32-core second-gen Threadripper processor. There you go. There's the, <clears throat> the previous-gen actual Threadripper boxes, but the second-gen Threadripper 2990X is en route, and uh, word is August 13th, this sucker will see the light of day. There's actually, we believe to be, well, it's already been announced, there's going to be two variants of the chip, uh, a 32-core 2990X and a 24-core 2950X. So 64 threads and 48 threads concurrent 
uh, respectively there. And wow, talk about serious horsepower. Um, these are optimized Zen Plus uh, architectures. So, um, you know, improved latencies um, in, in, the, in the core itself and among the cores. Um, and in addition, more cores, obviously. So interesting stuff. <clears throat> we knew when, when, when AMD first came out with first generation Threadripper that, you know, that, that four um, packaged location on the, um, on the multi-chip module, there was four locations, two dies were active, two dies were dummies, just there to stabilize uh, the, the package and the, um, the heat spreader. Um, we knew that there was potentially some, some room to populate those with four known good die, and they have done that. <clears throat> and now you will have a 32 core thread ripper uh, in, in the middle of August here, only a little over a month away, August 13th, is the launch date, uh, or at least rumored to be the launch date. Is it rumored? Yes, it's rumored. <laughs> it's not official. We're not saying it's official. Marco, chime in here mm. before I get into trouble. <laughs> I'm not sure how much I can say because I may be <laughs> taking a uh, particular yeah. trip to see these soon. But yeah, no, it's <laughs> going to be just a monster of a, a monster of a processor. Um, can't yeah. wait to can't wait to mess with these new thread rippers. Um, Complete overkill for most people, but dang, if you use multi-threaded software, is it going to be a beast? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Chris, this is your jam, right? This is your kind of animal. Oh, yeah. This is insane. <clears throat> you can video render all day, 3D modeling, game. Doesn't doesn't matter. It's going to handle it. Uh, I mean, it'll be interesting to see exactly how thermals come down because that's a lot of horsepower to be putting in a i mean it's it's a big yeah. chip don't get me wrong but that's still a lot of concentrated power and you know i mean they're shipping it with a huge well, air cooler um but of course you're going to want to go liquid with something like that uh ideally francois mm -hmm. saying not game on it uh you know the the single clock speeds probably aren't going to be there we'll give them that um but you know, if you're if you've got a work computer that you're also <clears throat> going to game on, it's probably going to do the but, job. <laughs> if right, you if right. you want to if you want to game while you stream while you render while you're right. <laughs> and doing twenty other things, it'll be killer. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we did that actually, Chris. On the first generation Threadripper, you and I yep. did a a joint session on um, Alienware's Threadripper edition, Area Fifty One. Yep, and that, that was thing. PUBG. <clears throat> yeah, we we're at 4K CPU encoding, 4K gaming. We were encoding a 4K file. Uh, yeah, streaming, of course, um, and it Capturing just didn't it. care. Yeah, yeah, it didn't. We were didn't rocking care. something like 90 FPS at 4K yeah. in PUBG, which is already insane. Yeah, yeah, and, it, and it didn't also care. Also, the would... NVIDIA 1080 Ti in that. Yeah, there was a 1080 Ti, and it, it didn't care, and that was only with 16 cores. Imagine with 32 cores. <laughs> yeah, well, it, it cared. I mean, there was there was some load there, but you know, 50 or 60 percent CPU. That was it. Yeah. Right. Come on, good Intel. stuff. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, it's nice to have some competition for sure, and this definitely one ups it for Intel. Uh, AMD's 32 core second gen Threadripper 2990X, the 24 core 2950X, uh, 64 mega cache, I believe, base frequency three gigahertz, boost frequency max clock, all core max clock at 3.4 gigahertz. Um, it will be a beast in a 250 watt TDP. No joke. Uh, you want to build a, a content creation mega tasking rig? This this is the chip to Boy. look at. <laughs> Adam Adam Kinder sixty seven in the chat says he'll be happy when the nineteen fifty X drops some price so he can build a home server that'll run our code in extreme parallel because his wife is getting a PhD in statistics. Well, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> yeah, that's it. You got a you got a killer gaming rig to do lots of stuff, and your wife is a smarty pants. Awesome. 
<laughs> that's great. Good stuff. Good stuff. Hey, let's uh, let's let's finish up on something that's also good stuff for a good cause. Uh, Cooler Master kicks off the epic Pay It Forward PC Master Race Hardware Giveaway, and we jumped into this thing, Marco, and sort of. Uh, tossed our hat in the ring to say we would, uh, what did we say would offer if, if we could build it, if, if we could build it and, and have everybody come? <laughs> yeah, I just want to, you know, we, we, we kind of noodled and said, yo, let's let's try to get in on this. Um, we haven't really gotten a response, but um, I yeah, figured we let's out. chat about it. Let, let's chat about it here on the podcast and see if maybe some viewers and readers want to go and nudge uh, all of the folks involved in this particular giveaway. But um, we would throw in an SSD, a uh, Windows 10 license, and I would love to build it on video and, you know, we can get it off to whoever ultimately wins. So if those parts uh, are needed and, and you want someone to craft the system, we're here yeah. for you, Cooler Master and everybody else involved. My understanding is that there have been there's been so much of a response to this that they're looking at doing multiple systems, multiple winners. Um, so, you know, even though I'm sure others are already contributing some of the same things, if there's going to be multiple winners, then we're certainly help with one of the systems at least. Interesting, interesting. Yeah, we'll have to reach out to our friends at Cooler Master so, and uh, try and get in on that gig because we can Marco can build seriously beautiful systems given the right hardware right i just love to do it it's just fun you know i, I like making network cables is like therapeutic just to sit there and <laughs> you know like stuff i don't I, know I about just that love to do it. Yeah, it is I'm trying. really <laughs> rj45 like just put you in yeah. a zen oh, or whatever sorting, sorting the little wires yeah, and getting the length just right and crimping Order it just it's just fun about it <laughs> Wow. Make sure you're not untwisting more than the half inch or whatever spec is. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Chris, you're <laughs> you're 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 a you're an IT admin extraordinaire. Yeah. This is uh, you know, crimping RJ forty five is right up your alley, right? Yep. And running the cables through the data center so it looks pretty because that's much more important than anything else. That's true. <laughs> clean cape clean cabling is important. It's important. Well, yeah, we'll reach out to the to our friends at Cooler Master because we got a few contacts over there, and we'll find out what it takes to to get in on this and contribute Marco's good services and an OS and some solid state storage maybe as well. Because uh, God knows we've got a few uh, little knickknacks kicking around the labs here that we can contribute to this because it's a great it's a great thing, you know. Um, just trying to get together for the community, uh, you know, for the love of PC building and 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 gaming and and all that good stuff. The PC enthusiast, paying it forward. I like that. That's good stuff, guys. I think I think that completes us for the day. What uh, what say you before we we sign off? I say uh, thanks for sticking with us, everybody that watched. If you liked what you saw, make sure uh, you subscribe and you know hit that little bell so you get notifications when we're live or post videos. And definitely come by the site because we only talk about a fraction of the stuff we post. Um, so there's there's lots of good stuff on the site. We've been online sheesh, almost 20 years now. Uh, so um, we're not going anywhere. We're not getting any younger. We're not going anywhere. <laughs> You know, that is crazy to to imagine. But yes, we started back in 1999. We are coming up on our 20th anniversary. We're going to have to do something, something epic for that when that day comes about, uh, which would be 2019, January 2019. Yeah, not too far yeah. away. Better start thinking about we'll that think, now. I'm sure we'll think of something. We're going to have to work <laughs> CES hard and get a ton of stuff to give away. There you go. There you go. Have an epic, uh, epic party there, maybe. We'll have to think yeah. about that. Put put our thinking caps on. So, hey, yeah, stop by the site, site hothardware.com. That's where you can find us on the web, youtube.com slash hothardware or hothardware vids, where we would like you to thumbs up and subscribe and hit the notification bell so that we can tell you when we're about to go live with this lovely episode of Two and a Half Geeks. And uh, facebook.com slash hothardware, twitter.com slash hothardware. We're everywhere where you'd like us to be. So please join us and uh, join us every week, Wednesday, 5.30, where you'll find our Two and a Half Geeks webcast. That is all for now. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for stopping by. <clears throat>